Here we go, no, here we go. This time, 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 What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Chris Hampton. Welcome to episode 121 of the Power Company podcast, brought to you by PowerCompanyClimbing.com. Today's episode is a bonus of sorts, I guess, um, recorded live at the 2018 CWA and is a conversation I feel lucky to be able to present here. Um, I've gotten an immense reaction to digging into these nuanced tough conversations. And for this one, just like you, I'm an interested listener with with hopes of developing a better understanding and becoming a stronger ally, something I think we all should be striving for, frankly. Um, Before we get started, though, I want to mention a couple of things. First, if you haven't been to the CWA Summit, go. Uh, It's an annual summit from the Climbing Wall Association that supports the professional development of the individuals working in the indoor climbing industry. And personally, it's the only big industry event that I look forward to. Um, It was really great for me in 2018, and, and I feel lucky to be presenting at this coming summit. Um. It's, it's in no small part that I look forward to it because they're willing to pull together a panel like the one featured today and to delve into these discussions, not in a, hey, look at us, we're having this conversation because we're supposed to sort of way, but more in a, what can we all learn from this sort of way? Now, as such, I talked with the superstar organizers, Emily and Laura, about some of the lessons learned and... And how billing this as a women's panel might be unintentionally exclusionary. And we decided that for the purpose of this podcast, the title of the event of the panel would remain the same uh, as a testament to our growth and the lessons that we've learned. Um, It's never going to be perfect. Hopefully we're always making steps toward better. Emily sent me this statement from the CWA. At the 2018 CWA Summit, the Climbing Wall Association hosted a panel discussion titled Women in Climbing. In the 11 prior years the conference was held, there had not been an intentional space carved into the event to support women or underrepresented communities in the climbing industry. To say we learned a lot from this experience would be an understatement. The Women in Climbing panel was scheduled to close out the conference with all attendees present for the discussion. We saw seven brave women share their stories and their vulnerability with a room of about 700 people. After months of planning, it was an emotional moment. I was incredibly proud for these women and was filled with hope for progress for women's role in the community as future leaders and role models for this industry. However, I would like to acknowledge that this step forward was an imperfect one, and I would like to express gratitude for the folks who shared their critiques to course correct the future direction of these conversations. In particular, Ava Kalia from The Cliffs, and Halsey Webster of Alpenglow Collective. Among the important lessons shared were the following. Allowing white women to silence discussions about race in the context of a women's discussion, or ever, is not acceptable. This unfortunately occurred in a roundtable discussion at the event and was not properly addressed in the moment. Also, naming this panel Women in Climbing is exclusionary to folks who identify outside the gender binary or are not cisgendered. The truth is, the learning process is continual, and I hope that year over year, we can take steps forward, identify and correct the missteps, create intentional spaces, and support and give a platform for leaders that represent the true makeup of the climbing community. In 2019, we have a few discussions planned with these values in mind, led by some inspiring folks who have made careers from this important work. My hope is that we can reach the furthest ears in the room, those who are thinking, I'm not sure this discussion applies to me, and also those who are unwilling to accept criticism. The truth is, these discussions apply to everyone in our community, no matter your identity. 
and it's absolutely necessary for everyone in the room to be taking responsibility for their role in creating a culture of inclusiveness and opportunity if there's to be any meaningful progress made towards equitable outcomes in climbing or elsewhere. Thanks, Emily. I think that's exactly why I love this event. So last thing, today and tomorrow are the final days to sign up for early bird pricing for the 2019 summit. By tomorrow, I mean at 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time on January 31st, 2019, early bird pricing will end. Links are in the show notes. Uh, If you're involved in this industry, go do it. You can thank me while you're there. Let's get into it. Maybe don't, maybe don't. Where you're uncomfortable or you had a blind spot, it's going to kind of hurt, you're going to want to be defensive, you're going to think it was way easier before. I can guarantee that this is going to happen because we're all trying to figure this out together. My name is Renee DeAngelis, and I'm the COO of the newly combined EarthTracks Planet Granite. And uh, my job is I'm responsible for everything that happens within the gyms, from people to programming to creating the communities that make us who we are. So I'm here today. This topic is really important with this amazing group of people next to me. I'm here today because I feel fortunate to have had a hand and to be part of a growing company that ensures that women are in positions of leadership. We've done a lot, but we admittedly have a long way to go even within our own company. When we recruit, mentor, and recruit and mentor women with purpose, the effect trickles throughout the entire organization and to our crags. It affects how we make decisions, it affects our programming, and enables us to build supportive communities. It's important that we start this conversation to celebrate what's being done now, and also to talk about what we need to do better and how we do that. That's what I'm hoping that you all get out of today. It's important for me that everyone in this room is able to walk away with something actionable to take back to their teams at work or their organizations. So with with, with just getting rolling on here, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Can you guys talk about who you are and what you do and why this is important to you? Um, My name is Halsey Webster. I am the CTO of Up and Glow Collective. That's a... (laughs) Thanks. That's a, um, a community building platform for women and underrepresented genders in climbing. And uh, I'm just really excited to be here and help move the dialogue forward on how we can make climbing a more uh, accessible and friendly place for those who otherwise might not feel as welcome uh, in this community. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who came out. I'm so thrilled for this and so thrilled. Thank you, Emily, for putting this together. Um, I want to acknowledge, I went to the women's climbing group and there were so many voices out there that had so much to say that I hope that we do you all justice in talking up here. Uh, so, um, my name is Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Copound. I'm from the newly formed Earth Checks Planet Granite. Um, I started climbing about 17 years ago. I was a route setter. I, uh, managed a gym and now I'm the VP of Climbing Center Operations for the West and, uh, I'm just thrilled to be here. Why this panel is important to me is because I feel very lucky. Renee was a very, very strong female mentor to me, and I think we all have a responsibility to do that. Also, something, if you, those of you who heard James Mills' um, keynote speech, he said something that really resonated with me, which is that uh, we all have an, uh, an obligation or a responsibility to share our narrative um, of, of our successes and our failures to inspire people, right? I think there's, there's a lot of um, a psych and collaboration in knowing that you're not alone. And so that's part of why this panel is important to me. Uh, hi, I'm Sophia Dannenberg, and um, I think I'm, I'm noted somewhere as a notable climber. Um, I was um, the first uh, African American, and I think I'm still the only black woman uh, to have ever summited Mount Everest. Um, and because of that, I'm, I'm asked to speak a lot about uh, diversity in climbing. Um, I've done a lot of my climbing, though, um, most of my mountaineering, almost all of my mountaineering outside the US. And um, issues of race, which I do talk about a lot, 
um, are, are pretty American, um, whereas, you know, uh, gender, you know, like sexism is really international. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the race is sort of a, an issue in the U.S., but when I'm outside the U.S., um, really, I think the gender is, is really primary. And especially as I get um, into the wilderness more and further out um, into the mountains, there are sort of fewer and fewer women. And so for me, this is a really sort of exciting panel to be part of. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shelma Jun, and I'm the founder of Flash Foxy, which is a women's climbing community and the Women's Climbing Festival. We bring together women, 300 women, over a weekend twice a year, once in Bishop, California, and once in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm also a co-founder of an all-female production company called Never Not Collective. We're currently in production of an all-female climbing film called Pretty Strong. And... <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, just to give you kind of an idea of why this is really important is uh, this year's Bishop Climbing Festival. We uh, had 350 women and um, our tickets sold out in one minute, like less than one minute. And we had over 500 women on the wait list. And I say this not to, to talk up the festival, but to say like there is a huge demand for women to come and climb together and have these relationships and connections. So um, I think the gym and um, is the first place for some of those connections to be made. So I think it's really exciting that we're here talking about this today. Well, thanks again for everybody coming today. It's um, an honor to be here. I've been climbing. My name is Lynn Hill. Um, I've been climbing. <laughs> Thank you. So I've been climbing for 43 years. And though climbing has changed a lot, I do think I'm speaking to the choir somewhat because I've always felt that climbing is inclusive. It was just very immature when I first started. The sport wasn't developed. There were no climbing walls. Um, there were more subconscious comments out there like, gee, I can't even do that. And I look at the person like, well, why do you think you should? Just because you're a guy and I'm a 14-year-old girl? Um, so, you know, there were some surprises out there for people to see that. And, and obviously, um, my first view ascent of the nose on El Capitan was really to show that women can do things. And you know, I've always kind of looked at opportunities and looked for solutions instead of listening to what people say, like, oh, you can't do that, and that's too, too powerful for you, or whatever the comments are. So I think it's really important to have these conversations and become more aware of the way we talk to each other. And it seems really apparent in all the social media how sensitive people are and how they react to what's being said, and I think it's really good for people to stop and think because we probably all are guilty of that and and we just have to stop and question ourselves and say what is the right thing to do and so I'm really proud and happy to be a part of empowering women and minorities and, and people that just want to climb and you know people that maybe can't afford to climb and I think that out of this discussion today maybe we can kind of direct people that need help in, in various ways to organizations that can do that. Hello all, my name is Becca Droz and I'm a climbing instructor. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, shout out Ascend. <laughs> and I live in Boulder now and I instruct at Movement Climbing and Fitness in Boulder and I run and develop curriculum for a spe women specific climbing course that is designed to increase competence and confidence in women to give them give us all a space to engage with fear and to intentionally build community and personal connections around that. And I also instruct outdoors with the Women's Wilderness Institute, which is a nonprofit based out of Boulder. Um, and less relevant but exciting, Emily wanted me to mention that I was also on the reality show, The Amazing Race, <laughs> as part of Team Fun. So I try and bring that spirit with me everywhere. <laughs> And uh, how am I here? I think this is indicative of the, uh, of the power of the community. I met Emily at a movement happy hour. The next day, she spontaneously signed up for a women's wilderness course I was instructing. And then we've seen each other in the community. She's in uh, the music video adventure film I'm working on. And uh, it just shows that this, when we build community spaces, it propels these opportunities. 
and mentorship. Um, and it, this topic is relevant to me because I found myself deep in this niche of women in climbing and I'm trying to make a living through it. So it's very relevant. <laughs> Nice, thanks everybody. To Lynn's point, the climbing industry has really changed over the past 20, 30, 40 years. Um, can you all talk about, let's celebrate some of our successes. What have we done, what are we doing well now and what have we done well in the past? Sure. So, I mean, like earlier, in, I don't know if you were in the uh, women's roundtable discussion we had earlier today, but it was really great because we saw just there was a number of gyms that had um, like, a really good ratio of female to male um, members and, and uh, people that go to the gym. And then also like in their leadership, there's a number of really great places that have like uh, female leadership from the top coming down. And it's just really exciting to see, see those changes happen. Um, even though it's very um, regional and in some places that don't have that and some places do, but that, that change is starting and, and also, we can have this discussion here. Like this, this discussion wouldn't have been a theme before, but now we have a room full of people wanting to hear about this, and that is really awesome. Yeah, I honestly, I can't agree more. Honestly, Halsey, that's uh, that's. I think this room is this the sign of our success. The the committee or the roundtable that happened was just so amazing to hear everyone speak about the. The, the change of the climate that we're seeing. And um, for me personally, I spoke that Renee has been a strong mentor. And I, I was curious if that was just something that I got to experience, um, that maybe she had picked me out and I uh, worked with to look into what, what Earth Trek's Planet Granite is doing because I've been such a proud, um, proud to be a part of that gym. And I am super thrilled to say that we have, um, in our leadership, so that's gym, like director level, working on our gyms all the way up, we have 47% are women. Um, in our senior leadership, that includes our executive team, uh, we're 75% women. And so I hope that, um, you know, this isn't just one gym, but that, you know, we heard those stories repeated and echoed by a number of people, and I hope we can continue to, to spread that. Um, I think, so I, I am going to probably be talking a lot about just a person of color and climbing, but I, I mean, this seems like an obvious uh, thing, but I think in terms of um, just beginner programs and learn to climb programs, I think back, I learned uh, to rock climb like 20 years ago in Japan, actually, out, outside, and I climbed for probably seven or eight years before I ever went into a gym. Um, but also at the same time, I, you know, I, I didn't hike or backpack or camp ever in my life until I was in college. And so um, I think for people who are in urban environments and who um, haven't actually been exposed to the outdoors through their family, um, it's a much uh, less intimidating and a more sort of familiar way to, to enter climbing. Um, and the proliferation of gyms and the ability for gyms to be sort of where they are and um, not having to go out into a crag. Um, it's things that people don't think about if you, if you sort of grew up in an outdoor environment that um, you don't have a backpack. You, you know, kids like maybe they just have their school backpack and, and nothing else or they don't you know, know what shoes they should be wearing to the crag or you know, for women you know, worrying about, or for girls especially, worrying about you know, where and how are they gonna pee is a, is a really big deal. Um, and so as a beginner, I think being able to take all of that away and to learn to climb in a gym um, is a really great um, place for people to go as a resource and, and it has that ability to be a sort of a great um, gateway to introducing people to the outdoors that um, you know, haven't had that opportunity through their families. So if you take how long Lynn's been climbing and you like divide it by nine-ish, um, that's probably about how long I've been climbing. Uh, so um, I, I haven't been climbing that long and I haven't been in this industry this long. I've only been in this industry for probably about two and a half years, but it's actually been a really explosive two and a half years in a lot of different ways. I mean, the amount of gyms and the emphasis on the importance of gyms in our climbing community. Like I think about when I first started climbing five years ago and we, there was like one gym in New York City. Now there's like eight and like four of them are going to be opening up soon. And I think climbing is becoming bigger and bigger. And as it becomes bigger, um, what's really exciting is that we're having these conversations that just didn't happen four years ago. Um, I remember when I started Flash Foxy, no one was really talking about this stuff. Um, or there was some people, but it wasn't a big main topic. We wouldn't be at a conference like this having a conversation. And there are just so many groups right now talking about access for, 
for women, for people of color, for adaptive climbers, for queer climbers, and I think there's all this conversation around, hey, climbing is diverse, our demographic is changing and expanding, and how do we create um, a culture that is reflective of everybody that is now in it, and that's a really exciting place to be. Well, I have to echo what's been said a little bit, that the biggest change that I've noticed in 43 years is the development of your industry, the climbing walls, and that's been really great for people to have access and also make the connections so that they can go climbing outside. Um, everybody needs a mentor or a friend or, or a guide, and um, that's one of the best things about what we've done as an industry. And also, you know, being that it's relatively young, I, I will agree that it's exploded, and I've watched it for a long time. It kind of grew, and the, the incline was there, but now it really is like a cliff, and literally. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's also because there are more and more people in the world, and we all need recreation. If we're not ha getting outside or even moving our bodies, then we're not going to function that well. So I think it's great that people are creating these communities and networking, and, and I, I think that in the next five to 10 years, climbing is going to look a lot different. And also the Olympics in 2020 in Tokyo, that will bring climbing to the world stage. So um, a lot of the issues that we won't even discuss here, like access and taking care of the crags, taking care of each other, um, those things will become more and more important. To kind of address the question of how uh, how the current climbing industry is like supporting women, and from my personal experience, uh, I've seen like there's a huge increase just in media as well uh, of videos and articles and highlighting women. Um, a year or two ago, when I was sending out emails to Women's Climbing Circle, I always look for a video to put at the end of the email, and there was only a couple to choose from. Now. There's a long list of really great, inspiring videos to watch. Um, just on like a more personal level, uh, after I took my single pitch instructor course, my instructors at uh, Colorado Mountain School were very encouraging to me to uh, continue further education, to seek out scholarships, and to like continue being part of this because there is a big need. The statistic that I think we've uh, we see is that the AMGA is plus or minus 11% women right now. Um, and so it's amazing to be part of that. And uh, another success I see is the trust and freedom I'm given in my role as an instructor to create, to be trusted, to create programs that I see uh, will, will benefit um, my clients and students and just given that freedom. And then I got a shout out to Shelma. The fact she's only been in this industry for a couple of years and has created one of the most like incredible communities out of like the women in climbing world uh, and has certainly personally increased my life am amazingness. That was really <laughs> articulate. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's amazing, and, and it's, the momentum is really moving, uh, moving fast. Thank you all. Well, let's flip that question on its head. Can you all answer from your perspective on where our industry needs to improve on behalf of women and underrepresented communities? So um, I think the problems that um, underrepresented genders in climbing face are the same problems we face in all aspects of our life. Like sexual harassment is a big problem. And um, we deal with issues like if we want to gain respect, we're kind of pressured to be less feminine. And we're assumed to be incompetent and weak. Like I, a couple months ago I had, um, as I started to climb, I had a guy tell me, yeah, on this one part you're gonna have to use your hands and feet. Like that was his literal suggestion, use your hands and feet. Um, <laughs> I know how to climb. <laughs> um, and, and like another issue is um, visibility and role models. And it's like one thing for me in particular is uh, when I came out as transgender, I didn't have any high profile trans climbers that I could look up to. And um, it would have been really nice to know that like I can be trans and a climber and that there's a space for me in this sport that I really love. 
I feel like I keep saying this. I completely agree. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, in listening to the chat that we had earlier today and hearing what everyone is saying today, I think the biggest thing that resonates with me is that we need to be more proactive. It's one thing to sit in a room and talk about it, but it's quite another to take action. And um, I think it's not easy. It's hard. Um, there was a chat a few days ago where you know someone asked you know how how do I walk into a room if I don't identify with the people and someone else jumped in and said walk in right just just do it don't be afraid um, and I think we just need to all rally and support each other with um, with inviting this change because it won't happen if we just sit back and wait for it uh, we have to drive that change ourselves um, and I think that comes through gyms I think we have a responsibility we work with a lot of people. We have a lot of new climbers that we're introducing to the sport. We, have a, we provide training for a lot of advanced climbers. And the message starts a lot with us, right? It's setting the tone and culture of what it means to um, be inclusive and, and have diversity and, and, and create equity. And I think, again, being proactive in that and ensuring that we're talking about it, that we're driving that message home, that it's, in, it's, in, it's a part of our core values that we're talking about every day with our staff, with our teams. We're holding our management team accountable to ensure they're driving that message home to their teams. And uh, there's just so much we can do, but it starts, uh, it, it really just starts with taking that first step in the door. Um, I think, um, I guess, I guess uh, from my perspective, there are a couple of things, and I, you know, I don't work in the industry. I'm, I'm kind of coming from the perspective of somebody who sort of walks into a climbing gym. And I think the first really quick thing is something that makes it better for everybody, which is, um, just sort of the attitude. Um, I kind of grew up in like the, the era of like the gruff dude who was like, you know, I don't, I don't discriminate against women. I'm like mean to everybody. Um, <laughs> and um, and now I think like um, as pop as like there's less of that, but as climbing has gotten more popular. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of, uh, I don't know what to call it, like a clickishness or like a cool kid thing going on. And um, I think that people, this isn't specific, but I think it disproportionately impacts anyone who already feels like they're not gonna fit in. So if you look in the room and all the people kind of look at look like you and you're and it's clickish, um, it's not a big deal. But if you, you know, grew up in a pri primarily African American community and now you know you're in like where I live in Seattle and it's like all white and, and now there's that clickishness, there's this, you know, walking into the you know high school cafeteria feeling. And so um, again, it's something that I think makes it better for everyone, but it, it will actually disproportionately kind of help the people who for whatever reason, and it could be that they're a person of color or they just aren't built like a climber, they're you know bigger or older or whatever. Because um, I'm not a cool kid, like I don't walk into gyms and nobody sees me as a climber. Um, and so I always get treated in this sort of weird way. Um, and I have this story that I, I told Emily and she said I should tell it because she thought it's, it's sort of funny. Um, and this was like after I had like climbed Everest and I've climbed like um, Liberty Bridge on Rainier and I've done like Alpine. So I've been climbing for years. And I was climbing, um, and I just moved to Seattle, and I was climbing at Squamish, and um, there was a guy who was watching me climb and actually had asked me for some beta on the way up, and he was like right behind us, so he could see that I was swapping leads with my partner and that I was clearly like leading. And um, when we got to the top, he was like, oh, you know, um, we were talking, and he belonged to one of these clubs in Seattle, and I had kind of said, yeah, you know, I got there, and you know, it's this, Every time I go there, all they do is sort of try to get me in the beginner class, and I'm not like a beginner, or so. Um, and he's like, "Oh, but you know, you you could." He's like, "But it's not just beginner. You know, you should you should take like you should do the lead climbing class. Like this is a lead climbing class." And at first, I was like, "You just suggest I take a lead climbing class, and like you are watching me lead. Like how like sub like weirdly subconscious that is, right?" Um, and then, um, but then I like you know remember he was asking me for beta the whole time, so I was like, "Oh, well, that's nice. Like, are you are you learning to lead?" And he said, no, I'm the instructor. So this dude had just followed me up a climb, asked me for beta, watched me lead, and suggest I take a class from him. Um, and I don't think he was like thinking about it. Um, but then I tell this story to actually other people of color and other outdoor sports, and they're like, oh my gosh, and they have a very similar story. Like it's actually kind of sad how common it is from like skydiving to like, you know, surfing to all kinds of things. And they're like, every freaking time I walk in and no matter what happens, I'm treated like a beginner. So I do think there is this thing about sort of, you know, how you sort of approach people, what are your sort of unconscious biases, and especially as people get more experience and sort of, you know, move through, sort of making sure you're treating people like well, <laughs> if that makes sense. You can always come rope gun for me. 
um, I, you know, I just really want to emphasize or reiterate what Stephanie was saying. I think you know, just being really intentional. The biggest thing that I've seen is that like when I go to the gym, the kind of diversity set that I see within the the people who are climbing the gym, I just don't really see that when I go to a conference like this or outdoor retailer. I'm not seeing that same reflection and. You know, I think um, I would really love to see some of, you know, the changes happening at an industry level. And like, spoiler alert, it's gonna be harder. It's harder to be intentional about hiring more women, more people of color, being inclusive, um, reaching out and mentoring to people who don't have the same background as you, the same history, like, it's more work. So like, I want you to be prepared for that and be like, oh man, this is harder than what we were doing before because it is gonna be harder. But I just assure you that if we can do that, like I really truly believe it'll just make our community so much richer. Well, a lot of great things were said. I agree with what has been said already. And I do think that being here in the Climbing Wall Association, you guys have a really good opportunity to help encourage the, the gym climate and, and also, you know, Sometimes outside, people are climbing right next to each other, or they're, um, you know, mini tractioning or something, and it's really just about their experience, and they're not actually engaging. And for me, climbing is as much about the culture as it is about climbing. And I think that in my gym, at least, I feel really comfortable. I'm kind of in the opposite position that most people are in, because they're all looking at me. Um, not all, but a lot of people are, and I just tune that out. It's it, I, I, I climb because I love to climb, and and you know if somebody knows that's Lynn Hill over there, you know you're being watched. So I just don't deal with that. I mean, I just let it be, and uh, and I think that's a good attitude to not feel like you're on display or your ego is you know vulnerable. We we all need to step up, and especially as women, um, I'm going to tell one short story about this about our attitude and our subconscious conditioning. So I was in Spain, and I was climbing with this group of people I didn't even know and trying to pick my way through Spanish, which is not that good yet. But um, anyway, uh, she told a story about going to this cliff, and she got on a really hard route. And um, when she got to the point where she was trying really hard and, and her, her self-talk, her negative self-talk came in, she said to herself something along the lines of, oh, this is really hard, I can't do this. Whereas she admitted that a guy, her partner, probably similar ability, when he got on the climb, he tried as hard as he could. He wasn't telling himself, oh, I might not be strong enough. So there's like this initial psychological self-statement that we have to tell ourselves, like, I want to do this climb, I can do this climb. When it gets really hard, I'm going to keep trying. And that's empowering, and it, and it goes across the board in business, too. Um, earlier we were talking about um, the job, that somebody was offered a job and they didn't know that they could do it. And they had to be convinced by the team around them that they could do the job. And, and of course they were confident, and you could talk about this if you want. <laughs> um, just the idea that we are able to do it and, and we can step out there and, and go after it. We might fail at first. It's all part of the learning process. But if we don't put ourselves in that position, how are we ever going to do it? So sometimes you just got to get out there on the sharp end and, and try your hardest. So inspiring, Lynn. <laughs> uh, so how can the industry improve uh, on behalf of women and underrepresented communities? Honestly, the first thing I think of when I hear underrepresented communities, I think of indigenous populations. And I know this is climbing wall indoor industry, um, but we hopefully all enjoy climbing outside. And if we love the land, we should also love the land and the people who have been respecting and part of that land for way longer than we, we know. And so incorporating their voice, the songs, the names, their stories. Shelma's done a great job at that at the Women's Climbing Festival. And, uh, and yes, the president may have stole our land, but who stole it first? Uh, the, another industry problem I see is um, that w our hearts are in it. And so that seems to be an excuse to pay us less. Um, and this is not gender specific at all. This is an industry issue. Just because we believe in it, we're altering our lifestyles for it. We put our heart and soul into it. We 
think about it when we're off the clock. We put in extra hours to create curriculum, to think about it, to connect with our participants. To me, that seems like a reason to pay more. Um, and seek out hiring women and underrepresented communities. We're out there. We're guiding. We're teaching. Have those those specific courses in your gyms, and then you'll be forced to find the instructors to instruct them, and uh, and expect to to pay the same price you would as an industry industry standard, uh, even if you're being taught by a woman. Thank you. Becca, that really resonates with me. And just to add my two cents to where we need to improve from an operational standpoint, creating zero uh, no tolerance harassment policies, but also reinforcing them with your staff and within your community so that it becomes part of your culture. And that's really where a lot of this needs to start. All right, moving on, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper. And so this next question is for Sophia. This year's keynote speaker, James Mills, shared a little bit about your successful Everest ascent as a sole climber with two Sherpas. That takes guts and a lot of courage. We would love to hear firsthand about your climbing experience. What inspired you to pursue 8,000 meter peaks? And what would you like to see from the climbing industry as to encourage more women to get out there and accept these challenges? Um, so I'm terrible about talking about climbing. I always talk around it. So I'm, I'm going to apologize that I'm going to do that again. Um, so, um, you know, the funny thing is, I didn't really like dream of climbing Everest, partially because I, I like hadn't heard of it. Like I didn't like I didn't grow up in this, and so I didn't know what Everest was until I was probably like, you know, 25 to 30 years old, like in that age range. So. Um, you know, when I tell people about how I got there, like, I, you know, people are like, so how did you end up on Everest? And my answer is always, like, creep. You know, like, I learned to hike and camp, and then I learned to rock climb and ice climb, and then I started some mountaineering, and then I climbed Rainier, which, like, every American climbs, and then I, like, a bigger mountain, and then bigger mountain, and, like, that's it. Um, and it's not a particularly interesting story. Um, and I always think that people um, want to have, like, they want to hear some, like, pivotal moment, or they want to hear some story of, like, someone who, like, plucked me out of this urban environment and, like, got me into the outdoors and something really inspirational. Um, and, and there is nothing like that. I've actually thought about it. And, like, I, I would have to completely make it up. Because um, I really just, like, even that first camping experience, I seriously just got a brochure from, like, my college outdoor program and just signed up. Um, so. You know, and, and I, it's, it's, you know, a typical story. Like, it's a typical story of how people get to Everest. Um, but when I, I kind of thought about it, um, like talking to a community of people who are in the industry, who are interested in getting, like, more people into mountaineering or into the climbing, um, I think this sort of, you know, maybe they should be more interested because it's typical. Um, and I have thoughts as to why I, you know, followed this path and maybe other people didn't. But um, there's kind of a limited number of people that you're going to help, like, by having some big gesture and some big program and plucking them out. Um, most people who are going to come to gyms and to climbing are going to get there themselves. Like if you want hundreds or thousands of people to come, um, they need to find their own path there. And so it's really about you know making sure that that path is there. Um, and there are things um, you know that we've talked about that the industry does control. And you can you know you can work on. Um, there's a lot that's out of the control of of sort of you and the industry. Um, it's more socioeconomic, or it just has to do with society. Um, you can influence it, but it's it's probably you know something that's bigger than that. And so. You know, I see it as sort of a complicated, um, this complicated answer, um, and that there isn't like this silver bullet. Um, but I do think, um, you know, in terms of what you can control, when people are on the path, um, you know, I think it's easy to get knocked off the path um, through discouraging experiences. And, and like I said, I think this um, disproportionately impacts people who are who are different. Um, and I, you know, I, I can kind of remember again um, subconsciously kind of how discouraging people were, and, I, and this wasn't actually men, this was actually also women. Experienced climbers um, consistently um, just were very discouraging. And I um, have this, uh, you know, I, I remember I, there was this woman and she was actually preparing to climb Everest, which at the time I wasn't, I was never considering climbing, but she had led a, she had led a team on a mountain called um, Amadablam. 
And I was really excited because I was trying to climb Amada Blom like in the next year. And again, at this point, I was a pretty experienced climber. And um, I approached her and was like, really like, hey, like, you know, I'm, I, I'm gonna try to climb on Le Blanc, like, love to hear about it. And like the absolute first words out of her mouth in exactly this tone were, what else have you climbed? And um, I was with like my, like my climbing partner, who's a white man, and we sort of left and he was like, that was really weird. And I was like, okay, it wasn't just me, like you heard that too, and he's like, that was, like really, really strange. Um, and I think if I hadn't had, like I was, as I said, I kind of started in this outdoor community in this apprenticeship sort of way, which is kind of like old school learning to climb. So I had a good support system around me. And um, also because I'm different, because I'm half Japanese, and I think there's a lot about me that's different, I kind of was maybe a little more resilient to not being knocked off. But I could see that attitude really kind of, you know, having, you know, feel, making people feel like I, I don't necessarily belong here. Um, but one of the things, and I just, I'm, I kind of save the story, but like it's, it, it just sort of even helped me with that situation when that woman said that, um, was that a few years before I had been at um, a book signing with Lynn Hill. And um, she probably has no idea what this is, but I had been, um, at the time I was a rock climber and I was just starting to think about mountaineering. And she actually had just, you told the story earlier, but there was, you know, she had reasons where, she actually kind of had some reasons where she could have treated me like I was crazy because mountaineering was not her thing for reasons, <laughs> very specific reasons that she had talked about um, in her talk. And, um, and she didn't, like she was really encouraging when I said, yeah, I'm thinking about mountaineering and I know like, you know, you don't, you know what, and she's like, no, like I think that's, you know, she was like, it's, I think that's really great. And um, she signed the book, like follow your passion and intuition. And um, for all I know, that's like literally how she signs everyone's books. I have no idea. <laughs> but like, um, like, but to me that was like, Lynn told me to follow my passion and intuition. And, she had, and like, I just had told her I want to do mountaineering. So like, she doesn't think I'm crazy. And if Lynn Hill doesn't think I'm crazy, then like, you know, I can do this. And so it actually was like this encouragement to me. Um, and it's amazing like how these little experiences like make such a difference um, in terms of, as I said, like having people on a path and like keeping them on there. And I think as you actually see people and run into them, like you have a lot of opportunity to either reinforce um, this idea that might already be in their head that they don't belong here or to make them feel like they belong. And so I think my main message is, you know, believe in people and if you don't believe in them, fake it, <laughs> pretend like this is like a young, like this person's gonna become Lynn Hill or, you know, you know, Chris Sharma or whoever you think of as an amazing climber, like whoever this person is, that's who's going to, they're gonna be. And they've just walked in my gym and I'm gonna treat them like I would have wanted to treat that person when they first, if, they, if I knew, you know, that that's who they were gonna become. Thank you so much, what a great story. I, I just wanna point out, I feel like it's such a great example of, of mentorship in a different way and how powerful one little gesture and, one, and so few words can be on one person's life. That's, that's an awesome story, thank you. So my next question is for Halsey, Stephanie, and Shelma. What are some examples of what gym operators can do to foster a supportive work environment and a positive gym and culture for employees and customers members? I'll just go down the line. <clears throat> so, I mean, like, the real solution is that sexism just needs to die, but, <laughs> but we can't leave people hanging in the meantime. And so one of the things we can do while we work on that is giving the people that face those issues a break from all that crap. And so that's kind of like the general idea behind the term, like, safe spaces. So things like women's climbing events and clinics and and uh, Jim DeCraig, all those things, those are really great, and I'm a really big fan of those. Uh, but we also need to be careful with those that uh, we don't exclude trans people. Like for me, being a trans woman, there are some ladies that don't want to climb with me. And um, so you need to kind of be, be cautious about how your, your language on that. And also there are non-binary and other trans identities that face the same issues that we women face. But by saying women's only, you're excluding them. And so we should be explicit on who we welcome and not have people guess if this is an okay place for them to be. And kind of on that same, um, you know, with trans issues and non-binary issues, something that, um, that like a very, very big issue is uh, the bathroom. It's like, there's the obvious thing that trans women should be allowed in the women's room, trans men in the men's room. That's, that's pretty obvious, but something that uh, most cisgender people, and cisgender just means people that aren't trans, 
So something that most uh, cisgender people don't think about is gender neutral bathrooms. And they can be really great for trans people in various stages of their life. And I would say they are even more important for non-binary people who really don't feel that they belong in either the men's or the women's room. And single occupancy gender neutral bathrooms are kind of like the bare minimum because they're kind of designed for like families like dealing with kids and all that stuff. And they can be tied up for long periods of time and we don't want to put that pressure on, uh, on non-binary people. And kind of one, one last thing is uh, just making sure that your staff and everybody in your organization is educated on how to treat women and trans people with dignity and respect. Like it's going to take a conscious effort. You have to, you have to think about talking about these issues with people and, um, and be ready to correct mistakes because mistakes will be made. And so having systems in place to provide follow-up and, and continuing, continuing the education, just kind of continuing awareness. And like, um, we have very little time here. I mean, there's, there's very few of us here too. So like, this is just the start of the conversation. Really, like, you need to be continuing to have this, going into more depth than we can provide here, um, talking to more people, and uh, yeah, I mean, this, th this is just the start of, of the conversation. Can I ask you a, a quick follow-up question? Yes. I, I talked to you about this earlier mm -hmm. when you mentioned it here is you can't just put women only on a flyer. What yeah. is a quick example of what would be appropriate language to use? So, like, um, uh, this is a very complicated thing, and it's like at Elf and Glow Collective, uh, the organization I'm a part of, this is something we've been talking about a lot lately, and kind of working, working through different, uh, different uh, phrases and stuff. And so one thing that we've kind of been considering lately is underrepresented genders. Just that, that um, kind of encaptures everybody that needs to, be, needs to be considered there. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. No worries. <laughs> uh, thanks. So... Um, Maybe to focus on some different things than what Halsey did said, because I think what she touched on is really important. Um, I think, you know, to look at uh, underrepresented groups, um, something that is really important is to have a giving program. Um, and, uh, you know, Elise Rylander, I don't know if you made it to her talk, she talked about creating more equity and not just focusing on equality. And I think a giving program enables you to recognize different groups and focus on what needs they have, right, that are specific to them and being able to, to address it so that they can then have equality within your, within your gym space. And so um, and for us, uh, it meant maybe you're not the experts at it, right? So I, I can't claim to know everything about every group, and there's no way that any of us can know that, but identifying the people who, who do know, you know, reaching out to Alp and Glow Collective. Um, we, we work with Big City Mountaineers, um, uh, environmental traveling companions and Outward Bound and their organizations that, that specialize in working with under-resourced youth and they work with those communities to identify uh, youth that are, are motivated and psyched to, to gain new experiences and we help fund them to get them outside and then offer in-kind days to bring them into the gym. And the gym teaches them trust and, and gets them a new skill, right? You know, I think those of us, like, it doesn't, we don't think twice about being on a rope and having someone hold us on the other end because we're used to it, but can you imagine how scary that is to have it be a completely new experience, something you've never, you've never maybe known about, and then you have to trust that and what that teaches you. And I think those are ways that, that you know, we don't have to have the answers, and I think that's something that we need to be prepared to ask the questions and to seek out the people who might have the answers. And something that I've learned a lot in the last many months but years is that the the younger people that are joining our ranks, like the front desk staff, the, they know so much more, right? Their, their self-awareness about the issues at hand today are, you know, as you know, Lynn mentioned earlier that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but also when I started climbing 20 years ago, things were accepted as okay that by no means would pass as okay today. And, you know, we need to correct, you know, I need to correct my knowledge of accepting something that's not okay and relying on these young people who, who have been raised in a culture that to understand and to speak up about what is okay and what's not okay. And we need to be open to, to hearing them, right? And I think it's hard and to not be afraid to, to make a mistake, to, to fall flat on your face and to host an event. Um, I was actually talking to um, Tonde earlier. He mentioned that he hosted a female route setting clinic and it didn't have any signups. And I chatted with him after and he's like, you know what, it, was, it wasn't the right time. And it, what, it, what it said is that wasn't the right solution. We need to find a different solution. And I thought that was such just such an amazing attitude to have that it's not about failure, it's about, well, that didn't work. Let's figure out something else because we want to get these different groups into our gyms. 
Um, and I think, you know, route setting was also something that came up a lot, and so I wanted to take a moment to address it. Um, in the, it route setting came up in the women's um, roundtable that we had to talk about, that it's really hard to, to bring female route setters in to find it. And I set for seven years. It, I, it was a long time ago, like maybe 12 years ago is when I stopped setting. Um, and uh, I was one of very few women, and I was very, very lucky. I set with a bunch of very nice male males, and they took care of me, and they taught me the, the sport. And setting has only grown, and I think... Um, you know, what can we do as gyms to encourage women to, encourage not just women, but anyone, right? I think, how do we make it so it's accessible? And, um, you know, we've started this apprenticeship program that takes people from, you know, zero, right? They have no experience to, you know, being to a point where they're confident on a rope and hanging on a rope. And, um, and I think, like, programs like that that recognize that people can start at zero and we can teach them something and identifying the people that can give them those skills is really important, but it also starts before that. It's the small conversations that we can all have and say, you know what, you look like you're really liking climbing. Like, I think you'd, you think you'd really like setting, or I think you'd really like this. And I think, um, you know, that, that story that Lynn mentioned earlier, that was me. So um, I didn't think that I could be a leader. I didn't think that I could be in management. Um, I thought, you know, what do I have to offer? I'm just this small, I tend to be a little on the cheery, goofy side. And you know, you know, I always think of leaders as serious and, and having to have the tone and set, set expectations, which, which they do. But at the time, I didn't think I could do that. And Renee and, and, and Mickey, it wasn't just women that, that, that um, mentored me, but they, they gave me the courage and they put the, the seed in my brain that this is something I could do. And I think those are things that specifically we can do and they're, they're not easy um, and they will probably fail more than they will succeed. But um, it, it just excites me to talk about that. It sucks that I have to go last because <laughs> their answers were really good. Um, I have to like cross out like five things that I was going to talk about. <laughs> um, so I really looked at this kind of question and the focus of trying to be like, what are actual actions that um, climbing gym owners and operators can do to foster you know, a supportive work environment for employees and then also for customers and members. And so I kind of wanted to tackle employees first and really just, I would say the first thing is to just kind of like take a moment to reflect about the culture of your work environment that you provide for your employees and kind of instead of having the mindset of like this is the way we do stuff so like you need to adapt to what we're doing, maybe creating a space, a safe space for people to give constructive feedback on maybe like a culture that doesn't feel like they're included in that culture and trying to expand that. Um, I think climbing culture overall, you know, it's a reflection of who was there when climbing first started and that was predominantly heterosexual white men. And so, you know, it makes sense that that might not be a good fit for everybody who's in climbing now. So I really hope, you know, my hope is that, you know, as we make these changes and we have these conversations that we're changing climbing culture to be a better reflection of all the different people that are part of climbing, and that includes like the workforce like culture in climbing gyms. And I think that includes um, like I think creating systems. Climbing does kind of come from this, you know, these roots of being really casual, like, you know, oh, we don't follow rules and we're just doing our own thing. And but I think to create a safe space for people who might be underrepresented, like systems can be really, really helpful for that. So I think creating systems that um, offer safe ways to report harassment or um, disrespectful activity that's been um, impacted, like inflicted on somebody, um, and a clear code of uh, I'm sorry, a clear code of conduct and a structure that shows what that conduct is, a zero tolerance policy around that code of conduct, and making sure that you know there's trainings around what what exactly that code of conduct means and what the repercussions are um, if you do. Um, go against the code. I think that having that kind of system set up is really a great way to um, create a safe space for everybody. I also uh, think like, you know, creating intentional ways to pathways for management positions for um, places where it might be gaps, such as setting, um, and thinking about why aren't, you know, and being really intentional, why aren't there female setters? 
and then asking, hey, you sat with us for a little bit and you don't sit anymore. This, you know, we're not trying, you know, we just are really trying to gain some perspective on what it could be that we can do better to make this feel more welcoming for everybody and taking that moment to get constructive criticism and using that to create uh, ways that are more welcoming for other folks. I think in terms of customers and members, um, I think if you do put these kinds of uh, motions in place for your employees, that's gonna make it a more welcoming place for your customers and members. Having more women instructors, having more women in management positions, thinking about, uh, or like, you know, people of color in management positions, thinking about what might, they might be able to see, hey, this is gonna make somebody uncomfortable. This language is actually a little bit um, disrespectful and having those multiple eyes and different viewpoints looking at some of that stuff, I think is gonna create a space that's more welcoming. And um, I think like reiterating what Halsey was saying of creating courses for people and um, different avenues to be able to excel in the gym as well as transition from the indoors to the outdoors. Great, thank you all. How are we doing on time? Good. Okay, great. So I'm gonna do a quick poll. You guys get to work now. So how many of you in the audience are gym operators of, of any, you know, sort? Awesome. So most of us in this room. How many of you run women's specific programming in your gym? So a lot, about half, would you say? How many of you define that as successful? And but for the purpose of this conversation, let's define success as that it's well attended, you have great feedback, people know about it. Awesome. We could have more of those hands raised. <laughs> and, um, but I'm delighted to see that there's a lot of people in the audience who feel that these programs are working. I wanted to, it sort of leads to our next question. Sorry, some questions up here. Uh, leads to the next question, uh, which is for Becca. Um, for many of your members, the climbing gym is a bridge to the outdoors, and it represents an opportunity for skills development and confidence building that helps your members take their climbing to the next level. You work with, uh, represent organizations that work with women to support their introduction to climbing and provide ongoing mentorship skills. What uh, from your perspective, why are female-specific Jim to Crag and Climbing Circle programs important, and what do your participants get from the experience? It's awesome to see how many gyms have women-specific programming. I am actually curious, really quickly, to do a show of hands if you have women-specific programming, and then keep your hand up if you feel it's successful. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, why is it important? Uh, because women or people who identify as women, I don't know if that's like maybe a healthy, can we get a okay on that? Is it, would you say that that would be a better way to word women specific programming as people who identify as women? Um, I mean, well, that, that definitely includes like trans women, but it does exclude non-binary people. Mm -hmm. So women tend to really appreciate learning in all women's spaces. Uh, people come into Women's Climbing Circle and say a variety of things consistently of, this is the first time I felt comfortable learning how to climb in the gym. This is, uh, my, my ex taught me how to climb. Uh, I want another climbing partner besides my partner and I want to be integrated into a community of women. Um, I want accountability and consistency for my climbing. I want to be pushed in an environment that is safe and I feel comfortable pushing my comfort zone boundaries uh, in a supportive network. Um, what do participants get out of it? I have a couple of uh, quotes from participants. Women's Climbing Circle helped me achieve my goal of finding confidence on lead. Not only did I gain strength and a newfound belief in myself, I met a pretty rad new climbing partner and friend. And then one more. Women's Climbing Circle is a great place to put your fears on the table and conquer them with the support of an awesome group of ladies. And for anyone who's, I mean, people are moving around and, and moving to new towns and to have an environment where you can connect with people and have some semblance of community can be a really, really powerful thing for people who are in an uncomfortable 
uh, new situation. Uh, another thing I want to note is that just creating a climbing program for a space of uh, an underrepresented community is not enough. That there needs to be intention behind it to create community, to create uh, personal connections. Because if we just meet up, we go climb, we do some drills, we say goodbye, where is the space to connect? Uh, so. Um, I feel compelled to offer three tool, specific tools that we use in Women's Climbing Circle that have been really effective at creating a tighter community uh, within it. it not, not including connecting everyone via Facebook. So one is we do show and tell. And I know that sounds really childish, potentially, and silly, but it creates a, an opportunity for everyone to share something about themselves that is not, uh, not climbing related and just a, a deeper connection. We go out for a drink and some food together after almost every session, um, and that is an amazing way to get to know each other. And also, that's a great time to get feedback about our course after folks have had a drink. Um, <laughs> and then end of, after every single session, which is a two hour, uh, two hour class, we always incorporate a debrief. And we have a specific question, but we also just open the floor to anything anyone wants to say. And people just, if they are given the space, they will share their heart. And that, as if we believe in Brene Brown's vulnerability creates connection, it really does work, and just creating the space uh, for that sharing and processing. I have a follow-up question. I'm going to go rogue. Sorry. Uh, did you do? You, there's a lot of conversation about cl curriculum for these classes. Do you teach the same curriculum to women as you do to men, or do you tailor it to women specifically? So I I teach almost exclusively to women, um, and so it is. I, I think the exact same course would work fine for men. And many men come up and say, where's the men's climbing circle? And we say, well, you can start one. I'm sure it would be very well received because it's, an in, it's a more intentional space. And um, I think the curriculum would have crossover. I definitely, we, we have like a standard curriculum that includes uh, classroom activities such as like creating mantras and, uh, and things like that, and then basic climbing drills. Um, but uh, we tailor it to whoever shows up to the class and what they desire to get out of it. And how are you given the space to start this in your gym? Uh, I started out working at Women's Wilderness Institute, and Emily Isaacs, who is the executive director of that, was running the Women's Climbing Circle at Movement. She wanted it to be taken over by someone uh, within Women's Wilderness, and she fully got me that position, and now I've been doing it for almost three years. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the on-the-spot on answers. Um, the next question is for Lynn and Stephanie. Women often feel pulled many ways by being both a superstar in their career, a great mom, partner, athlete. What has been your experience as a mother, an athlete, an entrepreneur, and professional in the climbing industry, and what can we do to better support those who pursue all of these things at a high level? And Lynn, why don't you start? Well, yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I have been pulled in a lot of different directions. I'm a single mom, so there's, um, I take primary care of my son and pay for it all, so that's challenging. And I get hit up a lot by you know, the industry, and I have a website and all that, so I, I spend a lot of time communicating. Um, but that doesn't pay the bills. The bills come with things like speaking, a little bit of guiding, um, and I actually even have an Airbnb business at my house just to uh, make ends meet because I live in Boulder and it's really expensive. Um, so what could be done to help people? Um, one thing I wanted to say, which is not on topic, um, which I feel is relevant in this discussion for you guys, is there should be um, some sponsorship for kids that don't have the money. Their parents can't afford to have their kid on the team. I've heard two stories and it's heartbreaking. These kids can't participate because they don't have the money and why not employ them and you know say okay you get a couple of years and then you can be uh, a mentor for the next generation something should be done but um, 
that's sort of related to what I'm about to say about um, our industry, and I agree with Becca, it's just because it, we came from dirtbag mentality, there's no more dirtbags anymore, I mean there are, but it's, it, we, ha we live in a world that requires making a living, and just because we love what we're doing doesn't mean that we shouldn't get paid. So obviously, pay a livable wage, um, give people opportunities, and set up a way to progress. So as a professional climber, it's not like football or baseball where you were paid a bunch of money and then you can just invest in real estate or something. Um, a lot of climbers, the older climbers, um, Jim Bridwell, who, who just passed away a couple months ago, I'm going to his memorial tomorrow in Yosemite, and you know he really didn't have very much money in it, and it's because there was no structure around what does a professional do. They're speaking, but you have to be self-motivated. And you know when I started climbing, it was a lot about taking personal responsibility for yourself. And I've seen you know that path kind of being on the crest of a wave, and it's just sort of breaking as we go. So I've always kind of contemplated this and thought, well, what can I do after I'm I'm through with my professional climbing career, and it just seems to have dragged on uh, as a professional climber. And it's like, you know, it's a really weird thing when people on a plane or say, or something, you know, a stranger says, what do you do for a living? It's like, how do you get paid for that? And so um, there's really no security for somebody like me. Um, you get short-term contracts usually. You might get a multi-year contract. But there's no health insurance, and there's no um, real security. If you get hurt, you can be booted that next day. Not that it's really happened, but um, it's not a very secure feeling, and the industry should have a little bit more of a program for how people can be spokespersons and do more interactive things with the gyms, like um, one project that I decided to focus on since I was mostly based at home taking care of my kid is um, a climbing video about technique. And boy, has that been challenging. I've been working on it for more than 10 years. And you know, I have to pay for that. And it's, it's pretty expensive to hire a video editor. So we could have a little bit more bartering. And a, just a, you know, it's all about communication and setting up this sort of system so that people can actually create stuff and get help doing that. Um, because it's really, time-wise, it's, it's hard to do a project like that, and it's financially difficult. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of being organized, I guess. And, and I take personal responsibility for my choices in what I do in the future, but it feels like I'm having to create stuff all the time. So, um, more industry support outside of what you guys do, but, you know, kind of like the big players in this industry could do more to uh, help people in that way. Stephanie, do you want? Yeah, um, it's, uh, thanks Lynn, that's it's, I, really interesting for me to hear and I, I don't know a whole lot about the pro athlete situation. I think that's been really enlightening for me to understand. Um, I think what I'll be speaking a little bit more to is within the climbing gym industry, how do we support people to um, pursue their activities, right? I think we all got into this industry for for a reason, right? We love what we do, we, we climb outside, we do whatever it is we do. We kite, we trail run, we mountain bike, um, we climb. And, um, and I think there's the sense that when you get a job where it's a desk job, you've now transitioned, right? You're, not, you're now at a desk, you, you have a lot of work. We're all probably, you know, if you were gym owners and operators, we know how much work there is to run a gym. And I think it's really easy to get sucked into that and but then we lose the reason why we joined this, joined this industry in the first place and the passion and enthusiasm that, that we all had and, and probably still have to, to stay active and do the things. And, um, and I think, you know, at ETPG we have a saying, you know, work hard, play hard. And it's just, it's an internal saying that we always say it to each other to encourage to make sure that we are really focused when we're at work, but we're really, you know, making efforts to get outside and, and making our work day work around our, our climbing day. And I think, um, I, I was a recipient of that, and it's something that I wholeheartedly believe in. And again, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so I was running a gym for four years. It was one of our busiest gyms. I'm now a regional, uh, I guess the VP, but I'm a director of, of multiple gyms. I work with managers. I travel. And uh, in that time, I actually managed to send three 514s. And I'm a weekend warrior in the very like, most biggest sense. And I, you know, that's tough. 
And I think I couldn't have done it without the support of, of my gym, right? Like I was encouraged to climb. I was, Renee worked with me to figure out my schedule so that I could find climbing partners in the gym and climb during the day. Our weekly meetings didn't just consist of how is the gym doing and is it successful or where we need to focus on what challenges, but it was how's your project going and what are you doing and how is it working out? And I think that, that's so important to, you know, as, as gym owners and operators to maintain the passion and psych that we, we have that got us into these and in this industry to, to be able to share our passion for other people. We need to keep that psych alive. And it really starts with us making sure that we're having these same conversations that Renee had with me, with our team members, with our staff, and really just, you know, trying to find ways to um, make that an accessible thing to them um, through flexible work schedules, through uh, just even excitement, making sure training tools in your gyms um, make sense, right? I think, and it's not just for, for you know, the V9 climbers and the people who are climbing really hard, but it's about, you know, people come to climbing gyms. What we've seen is people come to climbing gyms because they, they're excited by the community, they're drawn in, they make friends, but they're also improving, right? We all like to get better at what we do. And we need to create these processes and these systems in our gyms that, that foster that. So, you know, I think it's, it's ensuring that we're using our gyms and looking at it through the eyes of all of our user groups. It's, do we have enough accessible leadable five tens for people who are just breaking into leading and that they're, they're fluid and they aren't reachy, they, they flow well and they're fun. They're not just, you know, a jug haul up the side of a wall. Um, everything too, but ensuring that we also have the elite tools in there. And I think it's all part of the entire conversation and the lifestyle that we're living. And for me, it's really important because I wouldn't be a part of this industry if it weren't for the, the inspiration that I get from all of my coworkers of the things that they're pursuing, as well as just seeing all of our members and, and guests list, like getting better and being psyched about it. I was going to just add, and um, I'm probably running out of time, but I wasn't going to. I wasn't part of this question, but I was just going to jump on to something that um, Lynn had said, and it, it was um, sort of this idea, and I don't have a solution for it. That um, as um, about the pay, um, I think that one thing to note is that if somebody is coming from like a social economic disadvantaged background, or they're an immigrant, or in a situation where their family has really worked hard, like to get them to college, to get them through this, the pressure to like make something of yourself and to like do something that's worthwhile is is really something that you can't underestimate. And um, even in mountaineering, I think if, had I not climbed Everest, um, everyone in my extended family would think of mountaineering as like this colossal waste of time. And I have actually hurt my career because I've taken so much time off to climb. Um, and it's, um, you know, it, I, I think when I, I said there's lots of reasons why I think I kind of ended up on the path. And one is that my dad was the first generation in his family and he took all that pressure and he's a doctor. And I was sort of raised to sort of be like willy nilly about it and he never put that pressure on me. And that kind of allowed me the freedom, I think, to pursue these sort of activities that are not sort of, you know, in general society, it's not like basketball or something that's glorified. So I do think that actually affects um, the diversity, I think, in terms of getting these new people and these new generations. Because again, while it affects everyone from that background, again, there, there's more people of color in that sort of community. And so when I say there's sort of complicated problems to solve, I, I feel like this issue, that this is not kind of a glorious, well-paid um, sport, is, is part of the issue. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. So if you have questions, just raise your hand right there in the corner. Hi, thank you guys for coming. Um, I am fortunate to come from a gym where our you know, management team and all our departments really are super including of women and support women. And a big part of my support system consists of men as well. And I was wondering what your take is on, you know, when we go to hire for say our coaching department or our setting department, we just don't even get women applying, you know, and we'll seek out women in the community and say, hey, like, I think you'd be a great coach, or like, you would be a great setter, blah, 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 but they just never apply. So where do you see the responsibility lying in, you know, promoting companies to hire women actively, but also promoting women to seek out these positions and to be brave enough to apply for them? Does anyone, Shama? I mean, I, I guess I would try to find out why if you if there you know if, if you know people in your community women who would be really good for the job and aren't applying i would say to take that opportunity to ask them why they didn't feel like applying i know several women 
I've been asking this question to female setters a lot because there's this huge gap in, in setting with women. And I've asked some women I know kind of all over the country, like, hey, I saw that you set here for a little bit, but you're not setting anymore. And sometimes it's been that the culture of that setting community was not very welcoming to them. Like, it's not that fun to be somewhere where you feel like you're not wanted or doesn't it, that you're not included. So I think it, like more than asking women, like, why aren't you applying? Maybe we should be asking, are we creating an environment that feels welcoming to women that they're going to find this to be an enjoyable place to work, right? So I think it's a little bit on both sides. But I think there is also like creating pathways for women that you see potential that might not be there yet. But like if there's somebody on your staff who isn't in a coaching position, but you see them encouraging people in the gym all the time and you can see that they would be really great as a coach, maybe creating a way, connecting them with the existing coaches there to see like, hey, would you be interested in coming and trying it out, being an intern, being an apprentice and seeing if you like it and creating these kind of step, stepping stones and different avenues for women to get into these positions and just asking them to apply. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, how do we correct the people that make mistakes? So when someone's out of line, they say something they shouldn't, they do something they shouldn't, how do we correct them without just firing them and getting rid of them and throwing them into the dustbin of everyone that made the mistakes? I can start taking that question, start by taking that question, but would love your all's feedback as well. I think you have to define what you want to accept, what you find acceptable in your gym and your culture. Sometimes the right thing to do is the hardest thing to do and to part ways with that employee. And it, it, you have to figure out what the impact is not only on the staff who might have been affected by an incident, but the impact on the community as a whole. Because what happens within one small group, whether it's two people on the floor climbing in an evening or whether it's between some staff members, it's all really one community and it really will filter down and become the, the community and the culture that you're creating in the gym. I have some thoughts on that. Um, so, and I think that there's definitely like a time, like if you have to define what is acceptable as, as you were saying, and if this is outside of that line, then I mean, I don't think you have that much of a choice. But the often, a lot of times when um, people might do something that was like offensive or uh, not, not ideal, <clears throat> um, oftentimes they're not necessarily ill-intentioned, but just very unaware and ignorant. And so just kind of like in Alp and Glow, we, we are really firm believers in calling culture, like educating them and telling them, hey, what you did was not cool for these reasons. And just um, not doing it to, um, in anger to make them feel bad, because then that, that raises their defenses and then they'll never change. Um, so try, trying to educate them is something that I am really advocate for, but I also recognize that there are times when th there are things that are not acceptable and uh, that, yeah, there is no choice there. I just want to quickly jump in that um, kind of like, you know, this is a lot of the tail end, kind of like what do you do in response to that? But I think there's also ways to prevent kind of these situations from happening. And a lot of it is like training, like, like Halsey was saying, sometimes people just don't even realize that what they're saying is wrong and they've never been asked to think about it in a different way and um, or have never experienced what somebody else might have experienced and so they can't see it from that point of view. And I think it would be really amazing if all the gyms did have systems of training to kind of just like cultural competency training to help people to understand how to deal with these situations, why it would be offensive, and if something did happen, how do you deal with it? Um, and pr pr like providing them with the tools in order to be able to respond to these situations in a positive way. I think one more thing too, just to add on, is it also approach with honesty and caring, right? These these are these are part of our tribe, right? They made a mistake, and if it's intentional and it, there needs to be serious action, then we'll take that. But using it as an educational opportunity, like we just just show that you care and be honest and be genuine, and that will go a long way. If you're feeling emotional about it, maybe give yourself a moment before you approach them. Um, because again, you know, it's it's how Elsie was saying, like you you don't want them to get on the defensive because the whole goal is we want people to be better people, whether they stay with their company or they leave and go somewhere else. We want them to leave having gained something, and uh, even if they leave on a negative note, right? Maybe there was something that caused them to have to be be have to leave. Uh, if they leave a better person or, or understanding where they went wrong, I feel like we succeeded. I was going to say I think there's a lot to um, being 
And when people talk about being allies, I think, so when I tell these stories, I think for most people, um, when I play them back, if I were to play it back to them, they would see that there was a problem with it. I think almost all of these situations I talked about were unconscious, like they didn't even realize they were doing it. And if I just actually just like replayed it for them right on the spot, they would even themselves see that it was sort of silly and ridiculous. I think the issue is if I replayed it myself, um, it might not go that well. They'd either be embarrassed or defensive. And so um, if you observe it, I think there's a thing, um, even for members or other people, that if you are the one who talks to them and sort of don't make it so that it's always like the woman or it has to be like the person of color that experienced it that has to go back and tell it. But if like the men can tell the other men, hey, you just did this, um, it's so much more helpful and they tend to take it a lot better. And so I really encourage you to do that. I had an incident in my gym about a year ago where one of my personal trainers had a client and seemed like a nice guy, always treated people in the gym really well, but got a comment from one of my female members from the gym where he was, when he was working out, was kind of staring at her and being a little bit creepy based on her comments. But when she gave that feedback to our staff members and that feedback got it to me, she said she wanted to remain anonymous and not to approach that personal trainer client. Uh, I may have overstepped my, my bounds, but I didn't feel like that was the correct thing to do. So to respect her, but then to also respect the personal training client, I kept her anonymous, but I communicated to that client, hey, you know, we received this feedback and while whether well-intentioned or not well-intentioned, it's having this impact on this customer. And so it's something you should watch out in the future. That client, he accepted the feedback, but then got very scared. So when he climbed to the gym, like for a couple of weeks after that, he was always looking down. He was super afraid, super apprehensive. And my question is, did I overstep too much? Could I have done that better? Based on stories you've heard or things you've seen, what is a better way to approach these types of situations? I don't think you overstepped your bounds. I think um, if the, you know, when, when you talk about sexual harassment or harassment in any form, it is defined by the person who's the recipient. It's not, it's not a standard definition. So what I might view as harassment may not be what you view as harassment. But if I feel uncomfortable, and we're committed to creating a welcoming environment, and we need to do that, um, I think what you can say to the person is, I will do my best to keep you anonymous, but ultimately this is really important to me and I, I need to address this because you may not be the only person who's experiencing it, but I really appreciate that you had the courage to step up and bring that to me. And then with the fellow or the person, I don't remember, if the person who was doing it, you know, have the, have the ongoing conversations with them, right? If he was hanging his head and looking down, clearly there was remorse there and he felt bad. Maybe it was unintentional. Follow up with them and talk to them about like, I don't want you to be here. We want to create a welcoming environment for them just as much as we want to do for the person that felt uncomfortable. And I think we have to manage those conversations individually with the different people and recognize that each person is going to need something different from you. And there's no right answer. Thank you for being here. Um, the question that I have, as a European, I have not experienced some of the issues with gender difference that I all of a sudden found out exist after I moved to the United States as an adult. So my question is, you're talking about problems and how to solve them, but how do we teach the younger girls to actually never be in a situation in which we have a problem to solve? Well, I probably wouldn't put the onus on the young girls. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I, I do take your question seriously, but I, I mean, I would say it's not for the young girls to solve. Like, I think the hope is that we are all working together to create an environment where they're not even having to experience those things or think about those things. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say. Becca, you were about to raise your hand. Uh, yeah, the one, one way that uh, we work around that with particularly through women's wilderness, is uh, emphasizing conscious choice and emphasizing when we choose to say yes to something, why are we choosing to say yes, I want to uh, push into that challenge. And then also when we say no to something, why are we saying no and what are, uh, what are our reasons? And so having more consciousness about uh, consciousness and thus confidence in why we're saying yes and no. Okay, we have time for one more question. 
Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, so I've worked with a couple of organizations, Outdoor Women's Alliance, uh, No Man's Land Film Festival, doing all female events. And although I think that that is really important, I wonder if any of you can speak to um, the importance of women-led events that incorporate people of all gender, um, all genders, because I feel like we need to keep men and people of other genders involved in the conversation and maybe learning from women as well, and um, maybe just sharing some successes or experiences with events like that. I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously the majority of my events are women, um, are, are targeted towards women and are women led. Um, I would just say that I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think that there should be space for both of those things to be happening at the same time because the benefit of these different events um, are, are separate and different. Um, I will say like I hope somebody here, maybe somebody here will be really inspired to to start one of these said events. That would be really cool. Um, and it's something that's definitely on my mind and something that you might see through the programming that I'm doing in 2019. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's definitely like I've been speaking a lot more when I'm mixed in mixed groups like this about like ways that men can be allies to women or actually to any group that feels underrepresented. Um, and I think continuing to have those conversations and I'll just share one of those things that I say when I talk about the different ways that men can be allies is to um, just stand up for us when we're not there. So kind of, you know, to what we were saying before is that, you know, don't ask that the onus isn't always on us to call people out. Even if with your, you're just with your guys and somebody says something and you know they never would say something like that if a woman was in the room and you feel a little uncomfortable about it, like take that moment to call them out on that because that can really make a huge difference for us. I think one thing I just want to add quickly is in the women's round table today, there were some men in there and there was cheering for those men because they were, they, they took a step in the door. And I think that's also something to celebrate and recognize that it, it isn't just on women to make women successful. We, uh, there was a phrase that I learned today and I'm terrible at colloquial phrases, but when the tide rises, the boat rises with it, right? We need, everyone will, will be better through this experience. And one last thought on that for me. Um, and like why I was really glad to see so many men in like the, the round table conversation we had this morning and so many here now. But I also think that like having, um, having events that are just for people that aren't men is important as well, just because it's not always on us to be educating men. And there are times when you just need time that we don't have to deal with that. And so that's, that there, there, is, there is both, both things are important and needed. Great, thank you. I, I'd like, as, as we talked about earlier, I, one of the goals for this is to make sure you all have actionable items to take away with you today. So I'd like everybody to comment on what you would, you would like people to take away from this conversation. Do you want to start? Sure, so um, I mean, continue the conversation and there's like whether you have that with individuals that you know, um, or, and there's, there's organizations out there that, that can help um, you or, or your, your gym continue with these conversations. So like Alpen Gold Collective, we do that. There's other groups, um, a Varna group, um, Out There Adventures, uh, Brown Girls Climb. The, the, these are all really great groups that can help you continue to have these conversations. I agree with that. And I think, you know, those conversations also need to continue past this, not just with other people, but also with your teams. I think I, I always leave the CWA feeling super inspired and psyched, and I want to take that psych back to my team. Um, and I also think it's really important that you give people the space to share their narrative. That, as I said earlier, that really resonated with me. People get inspired by seeing, by identifying with people who, who do something, right? And so they, you know, the more that we can help give give people, give the members of your community to have a voice, to share their narrative, to inspire others, that will only encourage them to participate. Um, in the Women's Roundtable, the number of, when there were more women involved in a gym, there were more women. Like it was this very obvious trend and people like to, to walk into a space and see people who, who look like them or who they identify with. Um, and that's regardless of race, gender, sex, or orientation. It's just, it's just who you identify with. Um, yeah, I mean, I really want to second that. I think that especially having uh, more people that are working in the industry will really help to get more 
um, diverse people into as as clients, as climbers. Um, you know, a lot of what I've been saying is, you know, I think that there's a lot that that people are doing that's unconscious, and I and for me, there is a lot about just being more opening and more welcoming to everyone very consciously, and I do think that that will help. Um, I think there's just a lot that's already changing. Um, I remember, like, I used to be able to do anywhere, go anywhere that I was going to be climbing and just say, like, I'm the black person, and now I have to at least say I'm the black woman, and maybe even I have to say I'm like the black woman with long curly hair, and that's exciting. Um, so so um, you're already like seeing some of these changes happening. They're happening in society. They're happening, as I said, in the accessibility that the gyms are actually providing and are really critical to providing. And um, the more that you do to actually just foster it and to, to as I said, um, be open, be welcoming, believe in everybody, I think the more it's going to kind of continue to grow exponential, exponentially. And I think it's something that we could really see resolved very, very quickly. Like, I'm in my 40s, but like certainly by the time I'm an old person, I think we could really see a situation where this sort of diversity isn't as much of an issue. Um, I guess my one takeaway would be like, don't give up, because you're definitely going to make mistakes. There's definitely going to be moments where you're uncomfortable, or you had a blind spot, or you thought something was going to work and it was really actually a terrible idea and now it seems really obvious so you don't know why you thought that in the first place. Um, you know, you're going to get feedback, it's going to kind of hurt, you're going to want to be defensive, you're going to want to give up, you're going to think it was way easier before. And so, I mean, like, I can guarantee that this is going to happen because we're all trying to figure this out together. And I think it's really, like, it's interesting because to me sometimes we'll be like, well, what are the solutions? And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't have all the answers. Um, I don't have the solutions. We sh the whole point is that we're making these solutions together. We're figuring it out together. And that just means that like we're going to make mistakes. So like be prepared for that and give yourself that space. Like own that because that's really the best thing you can do when you take a misstep. Like that's the best way to make somebody feel com like more comfortable if what you did just made them uncomfortable. Is to acknowledge, wow, that was a total misstep. I really apologize. I'm taking ownership of that, and like, let's try to move forward and grow and learn from this, and continue to move and progress. Well, I think that it's been really interesting to listen to everybody's perspective, and the conversation has started. I think that CWA should have some links on the website to keep you further connected to Brown Girls, Girls Crime and <clears throat> and a lot of the other organizations. Um, we were in D.C. Uh, climbing the hill last weekend, or last week, and there were some issues that came up um, with regard to the culture of climbing that was a whole nother can of worms, but I look at this as the beginning of a, an industry, in a sense. I know it's been going on for quite a while, but really we're at the ground level, and if you guys can network with these organizations and start your own parties and gatherings of all different types, you know, even a, a kids group that they can get together in you know, the circle of women. It could be um, kids that are of a certain age that climb together. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to welcome everybody um, across the board, and you guys have a lot of talent in all of your communities, and people want to take part. They will take part. If you want musicians, if you want um, people to help out, you just have to be organized and ask. And I think that that's the best part of this organization and um, this people coming together and, and talking. So keep going. Don't give up. Yes. And um, good luck with everything. Thank you all for being here. This has been a great conversation uh, to be part of. And I think that that is one of the big takeaways is creating a culture of communication and of feedback uh, so that these aren't these aren't unpaved roads that we're taking where we have tools and expectation that we will receive feedback and we will give feedback and uh, and to echo Lynn that we're asking if we don't feel like we're getting paid enough ask for more money ask for that raise uh, or that uh, promotion or for some to, to, to lead up another climbing class or whatever the worst that can happen is you get a no or you get another pathway to another opportunity and so I think What's been most uh, influential to me is how community has propelled opportunity, has created space for mentorship, uh, because in a community you're going to have people from all different levels and with different skills and expertise. 
Um, and it creates buy-in. And when people are bought into a community, they want to be part of it, they want to show up, they want to give back to it. And so somehow creating magical connection within that. And I have a mic in my hand, so it's hard for me not to do this. So ready for this? Community propels opportunity. Community propels opportunity, unity. Rebecca, that was awesome. <laughs> I am just truly humbled to be up here with all of you today. I really am. I have a little bit of the imposter syndrome going on of what am I doing up here with all of these incredibly talented people. And so thank you all for your insight and your thoughts and sharing your stories. It means a lot to me, and I know that it probably means a lot to everyone out there. And um, just to add my takeaways, I, I won't take up a lot of time, but my takeaways echo a lot of what's been said here, but I wanted to add one more, a couple more things. Is it, We've talked a lot about having the, the conversation started and ask questions, but I want to add to that, ask the difficult questions that you're afraid to ask, and also don't forget to listen. I think the key, the, the thing I learned today in the Women's Roundtable is part of moving forward is the key is having these conversations and to educate, mentor, and make women and underrepresented genders and the champions of this cause visible within our communities and our industry. It's our job to help women find the confidence to advocate for themselves and we need to reach out to become their mentors. So I'm going to end with a bit of a quote of something that I read a while ago. Um, Anne Friedman in 2013 wrote an article um, where she coined the phrase the shine theory. And in it she wrote, I don't shine if you don't shine. She goes on to say, surrounding yourself with the best people doesn't make you look worse by comparison. It makes you better. True confidence is infectious, she suggested. Together we shine brighter. So thank you all, thanks for listening, and hope to see you out there. Hey, I just want to take a moment to give a quick shout out to Emily for bringing us all together here and setting this panel up. Thank you so much. First off, a big thanks to all of the panelists and to Emily and Laura and the Climbing Wall Association for not only allowing me to record this, but allowing me to put it out there into the world um, via this podcast. I, I appreciate that a ton. I think it's a conversation that more people need to hear and more people need to be having. And I'm glad that I can be um, a little bit of a conduit for that conversation. So hopefully this sparks some conversation amongst you and your climbing partners of all genders and races. So you can find a link in the show notes right there in your pocket supercomputers to more info on each of these panelists, as well as to the Climbing Wall Association Summit website, which is at cwasummit.org. Remember, signups end at the end of the day mountain time on January 31st for the early bird pricing. Um, prices are going to go up after that. So get in there and get signed up now. Hopefully I will see you there. And um, let's chat when you're there. I would love to hear your thoughts on all the things that are going on at the CWA. Get on your social medias. Look for all of these panelists. You can find the CWA on there as well. You all know where to find us, powercompanyclimbing.com, at Power Company Climbing on the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the Pinterests. And most of these people on here probably have Twitter. We do not because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. This time, the bill, power. 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 This time, the time, the bill, power. This 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 time, the bill, power
Yeah.